it's after lunch. Mm. <laughs> but I have a friend with him, so. <laughs> I'm going to probably knock this over at some point, so please expect that. Now, there's always a surprise when you come to present. And today's surprise is not just that the projector worked first time. Today's main surprise is we're being filmed. <laughs> now, when I'm being filmed, I tend to get a bit shy and a bit nervous. And when I get a bit shy and a bit nervous, I start to talk to myself more. <laughs> Not to put too, too fine a point on it, I speed up and I start mumbling. If I do that, and you can't hear me, please let me know. Okay? The effect will be I'll become more self-conscious. <laughs> <laughs> but at least we've tried. Okay. So, I've called this neglect neuroscience and not being helpless because I think there are some very clear messages from the research on neuroscience that tells us why what we're trying to do might well be the right thing to do. And it also tells us why sometimes it doesn't work as well as we hoped. So what I'm thinking of covering is a bit of background on brain functions and development. A bit on how neglect of different kinds can impact on that at critical stages. I'm going to start off with early years, but I also hope to have time to talk a bit about adolescence, which is also a critical stage. We'll have some implications for intervention, which may be new ideas, or they may be old ideas, but with some context. And what we need to bear in mind all the way through are two things. Firstly, the rural context, which is the setting for this conference. And secondly, your own experiences of working with children and families and your own experiences of intervention. Okay? I've never done this this way before, so I don't know how long this will take. <laughs> if it's over in five years, then I've got my memory stick and we'll do something else to film it. <laughs> We've got my karaoke machine. No. I'm very happy to be interrupted with questions. If I say something that doesn't appear to make any sense, you may well be right. So please interrupt me with a question at any point. Very, very happy to do that. I can't stay on for the last question session, unfortunately, but I'll try and make sure that there's time for any questions at the end. But I've also taken the rather risky step of putting my email on your handouts in the hope that it's come out too small. <laughs> Okay, are you ready for some neuroscience? Yes. Okay, right. So, here is a picture of a three-year-old... What? <laughs> oh, right. Well, my computer has added this slide, which is the most important slide of the whole presentation. Now, I think my computer is exaggerating a little bit. But what it probably wants me to say is that the brain is very complicated. Brain development is very complicated. We don't understand it. We're probably never going to understand it. It's very complex. I would like to convey to you some of my understanding of developmental neuropsychology. It's going to be partial. It's going to contain some misunderstandings on my part. Okay? So please check, check, and check. The reason I'm saying that is that neuro stuff is quite hot now. There's a lot of brain stuff around. And if you're looking at a website or listening to someone and they don't supply their own pinch of salt, they don't do their own ums and ahs, bring your own pinch of salt. Okay, so really important. This is my self-declaration that some of this is an oversimplification because it has to be. Right. Who's seen this slide before, this picture? <coughs> yeah. This is a very well-used, very important picture done by Bruce Perry, I think, in 1997. And it's a contrast between two three-year-old children. The one on the left is labelled as normal. That's a child which has a fairly regular life. The one on the right is a child who experienced some extreme neglect in their first three years. And I'm not going to labour those differences because that's a fairly well-known image. What I'd like to do is show you another image that maybe puts that in a bit of context. This, I think, is a really interesting 
study. And I've put the reference up there, and it's on your handouts, because it's in an open access journal. You can all go and look at it and see what you want to make of it. Okay? What they did is part of a big study looking at children raised in Romanian orphanages, which is unfortunately one of the classic places for studying the effects of neglect, because a lot of these children experienced very, very, very severe neglect in those institutions. As time has passed, it's been possible to study some of those effects. So it's one of these things which is, in a way, very sad, and I'm uncomfortable using the results because it shouldn't have happened in the first place, but there's also useful information. What Van der Vert and colleagues did was they looked at eight-year-old children, and they did various things. They measured their social functioning, but they looked at brain activity, and this is the picture I want to show you. Here is a brain scan of an eight-year-old. The little triangle at the top is their nose. You have to imagine their head putting it towards you. The details of what this is doesn't matter too much. What I want to show you is a contrast. So this is an eight-year-old from the general population, never been neglected, regular kid. This is a child who was raised up to eight, raised, in inverted commas, in a neglectful institution. Can you see the difference? Yeah. Put them side by side. Okay. What these differences mean, we don't need to go into, but there is a difference. Okay. This is a fairly typical scan of a child raised in an institution, but fostered sometime after two years old. You can possibly see there's not a lot of difference. Who do you think this might be? This is a typical brain scan of a child raised in a neglectful institution, but fostered before they were two years old, who had had six years of steady, careful intervention. Here, here are all four. So the bottom two, there's not an awful lot of difference there. So the children who receive enough intervention early enough, by the time they're eight, after six years of, of steady intervention, they're starting to look much more like children who've never been neglected than children who have. Okay? And I'm offering that just as a visual contrast to the picture we all know, which is for Bruce Perry, which is when there isn't intervention. So we're all here for a very, very good reason. But we are not helpless about this. I mean, that's just brain scans, so, so what? Who cares? Here's the parallel data on social functioning. I don't know if you could see, but you can probably guess who is which column. So we have children who were never neglected, children who'd received intervention at a critical period for long enough. And you can see, you can see the difference there. It's a very, very simple visual point. OK. So this is really worth talking about, because people are not necessarily doomed by their early experiences if they have enough other early experiences, which is why we're here. Right, let's try and sort all this out. Little discussion with the person next to you. Here is James's first trick question of the afternoon. What is your brain for, don't say, thinking? What's your brain for? <laughs> Okie dokie, that's long enough. Any suggestions? What's your brain for? The gentleman at the back with the camera. Processing information. Okay. Oh, it doesn't have to be one word. Who said one word? Processing information. Okay. What else? Keeping you out of danger. Yep. Life. Life. Yes, life. Like staying alive or life in general. Yeah. Okay. Ah, different parts of the brain for different things. Yes, to do all the different jobs. Yeah. What other jobs can we do? Yes, like hard to hold information for us. Yeah. What else? Interpret experience. Interpret experience. Yeah. Remembers. Remembering things. Yeah. Social interaction. Social interaction. Very good. Yeah. Coping with all these difficult and awkward people. Yeah. 
Making connections. Making connections. What else? Emotions. Emotions. Yeah. Is anyone here awake? Your brain's doing that. Is anyone here feeling a little slight, slow sleepiness? Your brain's doing that. Is anyone disregarding that slow sleepiness? Your brain's doing that. Did anyone have any lunch? Who told you it was lunchtime? Susan. Susan. <laughs> yeah. But what actually started you picking up a sandwich and putting it in your mouth? Your brain, your brain did that. Yeah. Okay. So we've got loads of jobs, and some of the brain's most important jobs, the thing it spends most of its time thinking about, are exactly the things that we never think about because the brain's thinking about them. So here is the first misleading diagram of the afternoon. It includes quite a few jobs that the brain does. So it keeps our body temperature right, keeps our heart rate right, puts us to sleep, wakes us up, decides how awake we're going to be. It deals with what it decides whether we're hungry, it decides whether we're, we need food, it decides what to do about that, it stores lots of actions, and then it runs some of the things we think of as higher end things like abstract thought, it does our social interactions, and so on. There are two misleading things about this picture. Can anyone guess what they are? Or even They're a third one? The brain, okay, it doesn't look like that, it's a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> Mine does. It's not in my brain, I put a camera. Yeah, in terms of how much the brain actually cares about all this stuff, the hierarchy is wrong. That's our Western civilization hierarchy, okay? Abstract thought, right at the top, the interactions. The brain's point of view, the importance is actually the other way around and what it spends most of its time and the glucose that you've just ingested doing on that. The other thing which is wrong, we were nearly, nearly with that. It doesn't show the connections. Right. Actually, this picture should be ten times as big to show all the connections between the different tasks. Okay? So I'm going to try and show you live what that's like. Because I have with me some brain scanning technology. <laughs> You're probably aware of some of the main line brain scanning technologies. There's EEGs. Anyone ever had one of those? It's what they did with those children in Romania. They put lots and lots of things in front of you on, on your scalp and they show you horrible flashing pictures. And then at the end, they rip it off. <coughs> yeah. I've had an EEG. I hated it. I was very small. There's CAT scanning. There's also functional magnetic resonance imaging, which can be really, really useful. Well, Highland Council can't afford any of those things and they don't fit in my car. So I have brought along my own PTS scanner. Okay? And my PTS scanner is a picture of a tea teapot scan. So, what I'd like you to imagine is that you're picking up a teapot. Okay, got that? So you've picked up the teapot, and it turns out that the handle is scalding hot. What's your first impulse? Drop it. It's, it's probably to drop it. There's an impulse to drop it. Um, okay, do you drop it? No. Oh. So how come you don't drop it when you've got a first impulse to drop it? You know it will break. Oh, so a bit of knowledge has, has appeared. So there's your poor scalding hand sending messages up your arm to your brain saying, this is hot. And the brain says, right, drop it. And that starts to travel down your arm. But there's another message. It'll break. I'll get scalded. So what if you still drop it? Well, you've decided, so what? What if it turns out that it's your grandmother's priceless Ming Dynasty teapot? <laughs> Did they make tea? I don't know, but suppose it is. Are you more or less likely to drop it? Yes. Trick question. It depends if you like your grandmother. <laughs> right. So what I'm sketching out are all these it depends a bit and how that picture of a teapot shows how there are different messages and those messages talk to each other and actually compete to decide what we're going to do. So... The brain has many tasks. Some tasks are more important than others, and that might depend. It might depend on an assessment of the situation, whether this is a valuable teapot. They're handled by multiple systems, and the systems need to be coordinated, otherwise we're not going to get anywhere. And those systems 
can override each other, like when you didn't drop the teapot. So here's a picture of, I don't know, this is my brain. And oh, this little green thing, the hypothalamus, one of its jobs is to look after feeding. And it's thinking, I've had lunch, everything is all right. On the other hand, there's a very tempting tonic bar just here. So it's kind of saying, why don't we eat this tonic bar? And that message goes through into various centers. But here, my prefrontal cortex, which is more like the thinking bit of me, says, hang on a minute, you're meant to be giving a presentation. You can't just eat tonic bars. So that pulls my hand back again. But then that wakes up the sensory cortex. And it looks around the room. It says, there's a hundred people. And the message goes to the amygdala, which does fear. And the amygdala says, run. <laughs> So the brainstem, and the brainstem sends a message to the muscle saying, run! But then the ear says, oh, they laughed, they might be nice. So it catches up with that message. And the prefrontal cortex says, you idiot, you're an Elgin giving a presentation. It's all right. It'll be over by 2.30. And so I stay where I am. Okay? So that in very slow motion is roughly what happens over about 10 to 50 milliseconds too fast for you to notice. You only notice events that take about 100 or 200 milliseconds in your brain. It's, too far, it's called below the threshold. You don't even notice it. But it all happens, and it's happening all the time. And it's an absolute miracle that it works at all. Okay? So your experience is of one thing happening. It's just me. The reality, it's more like a committee. It's kind of GERFAC. <laughs> It's go for Have a good day. It's, uh, <laughs> no one from Highland here. No, don't tell Ben Alexander. It's, it's Gerfeck on gluto, glucocorticoids. Right. So, how do we get there developmentally? Because I'm claiming to be a well-functioning adult. All right. So, how do we get there developmentally? And this is going to tell us about neglect and what neglect disrupts. So, now let's talk about marshmallows. <clears throat> what would happen? If you offered a marshmallow to a washing machine, <laughs> nothing. A sheep, it might eat it. Me, I don't like marshmallows. Me, not having eaten for three days, I'd probably eat the marshmallows. A gelada baboon, probably eat it. A child of four, definitely. Okay, that's if you offered a marshmallow. Does this make a difference? Consider what would happen if you put a marshmallow in front of all those different people. I've just called a washing machine a person. Entities. It doesn't make a difference to a washing machine whether you offer it or not. The sheep? Me? Mm. Yeah, good, wouldn't it? A child of four. If you just put it down in front of a child of four. Temptation. Does that make a difference to offering? Do I hear the words, it depends, floating around people? Yes. Yeah, it does depend, and it depends on a lot of things. Studying what it depends on has told us an awful lot about child development. Have you heard of the Stanford Marshmallow Study? <laughs> Research psychologists, they're in Stanford, so they're paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, not like educational psychologists. They get to sit around all day and think of stupid experiments to do. So they came up with the Marshmallow Study. I can't remember, when was it first done? 60s, I think. It's been replicated many times. It's one of a few pieces of experimental psychology that is very definitely true. And the results of this study for individuals predicts many years ahead things like adolescent adjustment, academic performance and IQ, body mass index and health, and even your credit rating. <laughs> so if someone had sat you down as a four-year-old and done this marshmallow thing with you, it would tell you a lot. And here's how it works. You sit the child down with a marshmallow and you say, right, I'm going to leave the room for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. If you've managed not to eat the marshmallow, you, you can have two. But if you want to eat the marshmallow, that's fine. It's okay to eat it. But if you manage not to, you can have two. Okay, says the child. So here's what happens. <laughs> Can you do in your mind the tick-tock? Tick? <laughs> <laughs> These are three pictures they're taken from the Telegraph, so they're, they're reasonably out of the show. 
Can anybody guess what happens next? He eats it. He eats it. Okay. So what's being studied there is how the different brain systems communicate to each other. Because like you with a teapot, the little four-year-old arm just wants to shoot out and pick the marshmallow. But other brain centers have heard the message that if you restrain the arm, you'll get more marshmallows, and that's better. So they say, put the arm back again. But the four-year-old feeding impulse wants to stretch out its arm again, and then it gets pulled back again. And you see the kind of conflict going on. Yeah? So that conflict you're seeing is the different members of the committee making their different points. And finally, one of them tries. Okay? One of the reasons I've picked this example is that I quite often have consultations with foster carers and uh, adoptive parents about children who can't not eat. Um, I've met children who have trouble using a knife and fork, not because they can't use a knife and fork manually, but because the, the impulse to take the food is so strong. Okay? So how do they get to that? Okay. So one of the things we're going to see neglect does is it affects how those different systems interact to do the brain's most important thing, which is to keep you alive and to keep you safe. So, in general, developmentally speaking, you know about the nature-nurture debates. Are we born with stuff or do we learn it all? Yeah, it's, I think everyone's clear now that's the wrong question. There are lots and lots of innate, in, innate abilities that we're born with, but they need input to develop properly. So one example is language. Children, when they're born, respond to pretty well every speech sound known to human beings. They do. They're born able to respond to all those things. By the time they're about six months, they're only really responding to the sounds that they hear. So the unneeded knowledge gets chucked out really, really quickly. So that's an example of something very innate, but then the input develops it. <coughs> Everyone seems to have a kind of universal grammar. It seems that we're born with a basic shape of language. But which language depends on which language we hear and which language we interact with. We know that if babies don't get a lot of baby talk, a lot of talking to, there are very often language delays. Okay? So it's innate systems, but they need to unpack and they need input to do that. And in the course of development, there are two things going on. There are specific areas and functions that mature, specific knowledge, but there's also the connections and the coordination. Okay? And language for humans is quite important in this, because language is a way of getting things done, as I'll show in a minute. So you need to grow lots of connections with planning, actions, and emotion. But when you're born, you don't know what the right actions are, and you don't know what the right emotions are. So you use experience to determine that. So experience tells you what action to deploy for what. Let me give you an example. Here's a baby. And the baby is experiencing hunger. Feels hungry. So the central nervous system asks the question, what do I know to do about hunger? And I know to do nothing, and I know to cry, and I know to scream and scream and scream and scream. Okay? That was me when I was a baby. That was the only thing I knew how to do. So suppose what happens is that the baby cries, and the need is satisfied. So what happens over time is that that connection between what do I do about hunger and the action of crying gets stronger and stronger, which means the crying gets more likely. It becomes the appropriate action for if you're hungry. To take that slightly further on, sometimes nothing can grow as a connection as well. Because if the brain knows that the need is going to be satisfied regularly, perhaps it doesn't need to expend the energy crying. So you might have two connections getting stronger, crying and nothing. And the committee will discuss what seems to be the best thing to do in the circumstances. Another child, where the need isn't satisfied, or is satisfied unpredictably, 
the connection to the natural behaviour, to cry and cry and scream and scream, might get stronger. And that might become the more likely behaviour in response to a felt need. Let's connect this with language. Because what then happens is that as the baby learns language, instead of cry, it becomes tell them what I need, which was what crying was for. And that might then connect to the tools in the language box, whatever language the infant is learning to express the fact that they need to eat, which is usually want a sweetie or something like that. It's never want a healthy fruit bar. Okay? So tell them what I need. So those connections get stronger and stronger. But suppose the brain looks in the language box and there isn't anything because language hasn't developed or hasn't developed well enough. Then you might go back to actions. You might go back to having to escalate your call for help. Or if your language is developing fine because everyone's done loads and loads of baby talk but you haven't been fed consistently then you're back to the child where the connection to screaming and place down is stronger and that might connect to actions go find food grab food fight for food whatever okay. do you get the idea about how the different connections grow and how the brain learns what works in a given situation and as those connections grow they start to establish the patterns for what the child has learned is the way to solve the problem. And then those patterns form the pattern for the more mature responses. Okay. So, James, please can I have your tonic bar is based on the pathway to them what I need. No, you can't. <laughs> so, let's look specifically at a key brain system. Is that all right so far? Is there anything I haven't explained? Very well. Okay. Let's look at a key brain system which is the HPA axis. Now, no way on film can I tell you what HPA stands for, but it's something like hypothalamopituriadrenal system. I'll show you a picture. It involves three, three bits of brain. The hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenal cortex. And what it basically does is it connects a stressful experience to a response by releasing a cascade of chemicals. And the adrenal thing is a bit we've all heard of, because that's adrenaline, okay? That's for getting things done um, response. So the HPA axis, it's a basic stress and arousal system. Um, someone jumps out of a cupboard and shouts, boo, and you go, ah, and then you go, oh, right? The O bit is your HPA system saying, calm down, it's fine, yep. It's very important for healthy functioning. And here's how it works. Survival need leads to a stress. I'm hungry, that's a stress. I'm cold, that's a stress. There's lots of horrible, unpredictable, loud noises around me, that's a stress. So in the face of stress, the HPA system, it activates, releases the chemicals, and that triggers a response, okay? It's pretty simple, stressful thing, response. The really important thing is that this needs to be calibrated. The brain has to work out what response for how much stress. Let me show you. Let's have an auction. What am I bid for my tonic bar? Come on, ladies and gentlemen, a lovely tonic bar, unused, has only been in my pocket all morning. What am I bid? Anyone? <laughs> Five pence, anyone? I'm not going to force you to buy it, just play, come on. <laughs> I have 10p, 15p anyone, 15, 15, 20, 20, 25, 30, I'm bid, anyone, 30? Pound. A pound! <laughs> anyone going to top a pound? A fiver. Okay. We're probably going to run out of enthusiasm by about 10 pounds, I think. But sold to the lady in Aquamarine. <laughs> right, okay, that's the bar. I have in my car the original Mona Lisa. What am I bid? Who'll start the bidding? A thousand pounds? Yeah. Yep, thousand. <laughs> Eleven $1, hundred. Yeah. yeah. How far do you think we'd go? I mean, people actually go into the millions bidding for the moment. Mm -hmm. so, okay, let's take something in the middle of a return trip to Peter Hedge. <laughs> <laughs> what am I bid, ladies and gentlemen? Will anybody start at, I want to get out of this room alive, two hundred pounds? No. hundred pounds. 
50, a fiver. Anyone give me six? Right, okay. So, the simple point here is there's a calibration here. There's a calibration of value. We have an intuitive sense that a tonic bar is worth about the same as... <laughs> it's worth... <laughs> <laughs> like I say, it's worth, it's worth less than the Mona Lisa and the return trip to Peter Head is somewhere in between. Because that would cost you on the, on the train, wouldn't it? <coughs> so, how did we learn that? We learned that through hundreds, thousands, probably millions of experiences of the value of things. Yeah? If you just crawled across the desert for five days and I offered you the Mona Lisa for five pounds or the tonic bar for ten, Ton of I would have more value. Okay, so it's relative to survival as well. But this, these implicit scales of value, they're calibrated by experience. And it's exactly the same for our experiences of stress and the HPA axis. So, in the course of healthy development, what well, in the course of every development, what happens is that gradually stress is matched to response. So this much stress, this much hunger means... I can manage. This much hunger means I need a snack. This much hunger means I'm in danger of survival. So I really, really have to do something. The possible stresses give us the dimensions of neglect, which we probably all know about. Basic care, nutrition, safety, relational warmth, and stimulation and soothing. And the experiences set the levels of response. Okay? So if you tell the HPA axis how much adrenaline gross oversimplification, how much adrenaline should I release to trigger what actions? Okay. But what experience also does is it builds those control connections as well. So a little bit of hunger, when I was very, very small, might have made me cry. But gradually, my cortex gets some control over this, and a little bit of hunger just makes me grumpy. Yeah? There's, a, there's a change of response as the top-down connections have grown, as I've learned to control that. So, it's not surprising that stress during critical periods, and especially in the early years, it leads to problems in this re reaction, in this um, stress processing. So children who've been neglected, their HPA stress systems, they tend to be hyper-reactive. So a little stress will give a big boing response. There can be some long-term downgrading in brain areas because they've had emergency after emergency after emergency and gradually they start to downgrade what they can do. It narrows down to the immediate survival reactions. We've got anatomical evidence for this, not in humans because it's not ethical. Um, we have it from primates, which some people might feel isn't ethical either, but, but there it is. We know that young primates reared in conditions where there's variable foraging, so when they're only occasionally fed, they're very highly reactive to stress. And that's because they only have two responses, starve and eat. And if there's a bit of food, mm, grab it as quick as you can. Okay? There's some interesting emerging evidence for early adolescence as a critical period too both in terms of stressing out the HP axis, but also in terms of environmental enrich enrichment and nurturing experiences, being able to do some kind of repair. But that's very emerging evidence, and that's really not something to take to the bank. So, let's look at this in action. Let's imagine a 10-year-old in a classroom. And let's track things through their brain to see how this works. So their eyes say, oh, Look at all these people. And their amygdala, the fear centre, says, yikes, look at all these people, and expresses fear. And then the HPA system says, fear, right, this is a major stress event. And it sends a message to the arms and legs to say, defend and attack. Okay, that's one possible pathway. But there's another pathway. Because the eyes say, oh, look at all these people. And they send a message to the thinking bit, the cortex, the bit we tend to talk to. And the cortex says, hang on a minute, one of these people is Mrs. Smith. And it retrieves a memory. Mrs. Smith always looks after me. 
So the cortex sends a message to the HPA axis saying, no, this is a minor event. This isn't a big thing. Problem solved? Not necessarily. Because what happens next depends on that learned experience and <coughs> learned calibration. So here's what might happen. The cortex says, no, this is a minor stress event because there's lots of people, but Mrs. Smith is here. It's all right. And the stress system says, sorry, false alarm. This was a minor stress event. And it lets the arms and legs know that, and the arms and legs say, keep calm and carry on, <laughs> doing, doing your sums or doing your, your whatever it is. So that's a good outcome, isn't it? So the learnt experience has been used to calm down an overreactive stress response to lead to a good result. But there's ways in which that can go wrong. And the first way in which this can go wrong is if that connection isn't strong enough. Because the cortex might say, no, it's a minor stress event. But if the stress system can't hear the cortex, because it's not well enough connected, it'll carry on saying, red alert, red alert, red alert, and sending its message to the arms and legs. Or, if the connection is there, but the stress system only knows panic and calm, and can't, doesn't understand the idea of a minor stress event, it'll carry on saying it's a major stress event. Do you see the contrast there? Yeah. Or, the memory might be different. So the cortex might only have, rather than Mrs. Smith always looks after me, Mrs. Smith sometimes looks after me. I'm not decrying Mrs. Smith, but maybe that's what the memory is. That's the lived experience of a child. So then the cortex's message that this is a minor stress event doesn't carry enough conviction. If survival is at stake, you don't want to know if a lifeboat works sometimes. No? <laughs> no. Your motor system will want to swim. Yeah? Okay. Or, it might all work perfectly well at that neurological level. The message may get through. It's a minor stress event. So the stress systems say to the arms and legs, it's fine, guys, this is a minor stress event. But if the only thing the arms and legs know to do is to defend an attack, that's what they'll do. Okay? So the reason I'm playing out this example is it tells us what we need to do for intervention. Because here's what the different brain areas need from us. So the stress system needs to learn a range of response strengths. So it needs a range of stresses and it needs to learn what they all mean. So it needs to be able to tell how much it should respond to a stressor. It needs ways to turn itself up or down. If that sounds abstract, we all know relaxation exercises. Yeah, that kind of thing. Ways to turn it up or down. It also needs fast connections to be grown with the rest of the brain, so that they can sort out what's happening, so that the committee can discuss. Yeah? The motor systems, they need lots of different action plans. They need something other than fighting. They need to have experienced what to do. And they need those fast connections. The cortex, the thinking bit, needs enough good memories to balance the bad ones. And when I say enough, I mean too many. I mean super abundantly enough. I mean how many bad experiences might you have had that need overbalancing? It's going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Which tells us a bit about intervention needing to be very consistent and very, very long term. But I'll come back to that. The cortex needs a little bit of knowledge about how I tick, that I get stressed out in a classroom, or I get stressed out if I'm hungry, or whatever. It needs ideas for what to do. Ooh, think social skills training. Yeah. But that also tells us why social skills training sometimes isn't effective, because that's just telling the cortex. And the cortex needs to get that information to the other bits. Right? How do we grow brain connections? Practice, learning, experiencing things over and over again. And again, it needs the fast connections there. So making it effective... Because you need so many experiences to grow those connections, 
Intervention needs to be consistent, and it needs to be again, and again, and again. And it needs to be interventions that match the brain systems. So your social skills program, we know, also needs live practice. You can't do it on paper. You also have to do it with other people in a safe context where you can learn and make mistakes. There need to be lots and lots of predictable patterns that grow, strengthen, and quicken connections. And any foster carer can tell us the importance of that. And it needs a long time. If your three-week programme hasn't worked, I'm not surprised. It wasn't going to work. And we, none of us believe a three-week programme's going to work. But sometimes we're under pressure to solve things very quickly, whereas we know children need the very long haul. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to challenge myself a bit, because I've been talking about intervention. And aren't I just talking about care and parenting? Yes. Because what are parents doing? Parents are intervening to help the brain grow. So these are exactly the same things that children need from parents, but also what they need from services to help them recover. Wraparound consistency, long-lasting, they need skills training, which can be very simple guidance. They need the modelling, seeing other people do it. They need soothing and safety, the mentoring, the scaffolding. Scaffolding, do you know what I mean by that? Things which you can learn from, which you can do, but they're not too hard. Yeah. Don't, don't put someone who's not very good at reading a map right in the middle of central London. Yeah. Start off in, no, so my experience, don't start in Elgin either, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Peterborough? Peterborough, yeah. You, you get the idea, it, the scaffolding. They need safe and real practice to grow their <coughs> So if you do girls' groups, if you do boys' groups, if you do whatever you're doing, that's why it's the right thing to do. It's for safe and real practice. And they need to experience themselves as in control. Because if what they're used to is their stress system taking over and running them out of the door, when they didn't mean to run out of the door, they need lots of experiences of being in control so they learn that they can control their reactions to things. So they need not to feel helpless too. And again, there's really no difference between good enough parenting and good enough intervention. Really, the shape of it is roughly the same. And so the temperature of the water is very important. It's not just for child learning how to swim. <clears throat> good enough basic care, safety, warmth, stimulation guidance and boundaries. And the reason I put that list up is just to connect with what we know as the risk factors for neglect. Can you manage another brain system? Yeah. The prefrontal cortex. You can guess what that is. It's right at the front of your brain. It's a really, really, really important bit of the brain. I was very pleased to read a study which told me that the prefrontal cortex doesn't finish, in, finish maturing until possibly the mid-60s. Isn't that wonderful? There's hope for us all. But most of the development happens during childhood. Now, it has those very important, it's sometimes called executive function, overall control. Stopping us saying the thing we were about to say, that clever remark, yeah? Thank you, prefrontal cortex. If you did say it, thank your prefrontal cortex, which decided that in the long run it was better to say it. Okay. It's really important with prefrontal cortex. It matures through childhood. There's a critical period during adolescence, which I hope I'll have time to get onto. What the prefrontal cortex needs to mature seems to be three things. It needs sensitivity. So that's appropriate and consistent response to signals. If a baby cries, it's comforted. If a baby laughs, someone laughs back, okay? A sensitivity, and for very young children, an anticipation. It needs that scaffolding, which I put into horrible jargon, age-appropriate problem-solving. Not too much too young, yeah? But enough, enough to challenge, enough as you're growing. And something that seems to really help, the studies show that parents who use more mental terms when they're talking, their children grow up to have stronger executive functions, stronger inhibitory processes. What I mean by mental terms is, you look a bit sad. What should we do to make it better? Mum is a bit tired. Let's sit and have a rest. Okay? Just simple use of mental terms help to mature the prefrontal cortex. And we need to have that in, in parenting programs and advice for parents. 
And the point is that it works together with the stress system. These two areas, they work together. And if children have adaptive experiences of early stress, then their executive function grows. They get better at problem solving, decision making, flexibility, and there's an impact on their memory and attention. So I've just given you a huge list of what children need. And it makes me think it's an awful lot. And it makes me think who provides that. And we often think parents provide that. And we know the risk factors for neglect are usually linked to things which might make it difficult for parents to provide that. Whether it's mental health difficulties, social economic stress, violence in the home, whatever. So how do we support parents? How do we all help kids grow and develop? And this is really where I think it matters in a rural setting. Because there's lots and lots of different people can have an impact, but they're not necessarily thinking that they are. A GP who thinks to ask if a mum is safe, if she doesn't seem to be. Uh, people who plan bus routes so that families can go shopping together. Um, people who look after the village hall, the village hall committee. They may not think they're doing preventive work to prevent neglect and prevent the effects of neglect, but they are. And anything we can do as public or other bodies to help that helps. Libraries. Library services are an extremely important part of preventing neglect. I don't know how many librarians who go around in their vans think they're preventing neglect, but they are. Maybe they need to know that. Maybe we all need to know that when we're making decisions about whether to fund libraries. He said controversially. I like reading. <laughs> Employability services. Helping young parents into jobs. Helping youngsters grow the skills for employment. That's preventing neglect. And it's for prevention that matters. So that the HPA doesn't end up hyper-aroused. So that children learn the adaptive scale of responses. So that they can learn a menu of different responses. To say, I'm scared, rather than hitting out, or whatever. And to grow all those connections. And just to remind you that it works, it might have taken six years, but it worked for those children. Okay? That's differences in social functioning. I've got ten minutes left. Can I talk a little bit about adolescence? I'll be right. Okay. Now, I've spoiled it because my next thing was, okay, which age of children do you think is most likely to be neglected? There you are. It's the green ones. 12 to 14, just pips. 6 to 8. Now, this is problematic because these are reported statistics. Okay, these are the ones who get known about. But when I saw that, when I was preparing for today, and when I saw that, that actually opened my eyes. I hadn't realised that. That, uh, that as an age group, there was such a vulnerability to neglect. So I'll stick to what I do know about, which is the psychology. And there's growing evidence that adolescence is another critical period in the same way that we know early years are. And it's especially a critical period for those growing of executive function skills, for growing of connections and control. There's very tentative evidence that environmental enrichment, so that stimulation and scaffolding and so on, can to a certain degree help to repair hyperreactivity in the stress system. It's very tentative because it's only been shown with rats. Okay? So don't build anything on it. But there is some emerging evidence that intervening in adolescence can be very, very effective. And there's human evidence for that. The key risk in adolescence tends to be supervisory neglect. Or, to make that less blameful, overwhelming responsibility. Mm. Just at a time when we think they're getting more capable, and when parents might quite naturally think, he's 14, he can look after himself. Ah, he can't, because of the way the brain is developing. And there's a very strong link between offending behaviour and adolescent onset neglect. Children who've been neglected through their lives are at risk of developing offending behaviour, but so are people who experience neglect for the first time in adolescence. So it is a critical period. 
Some key things which are developing in adolescence, there's the executive function and decision making, which we know about. We also know about risk taking, yeah? which is really good for the species. The young members of the species are prepared to take risks. Okay? It's really inconvenient in a modern society where the risks can be quite dangerous. But risk taking is a normal part of adolescent development. But of course that ups the need for guidance. Sleep patterns we know change and develop in adolescence. It all shifts slightly later. So it shifts towards going to bed later, getting up later. Just when the secondary school day starts a bit earlier. <laughs> mm. But it's an important point because at any one moment we might be dealing with some effectively quite sleep deprived people. And that's important to bear in mind in terms of neglect. So there's particular dilemmas in adolescence. Life gets more complex just as the executive skills decline. There's an actual decline in early adolescence. Working memory gets less good. Inhibition gets less good because it's all being rewired and developing. Adolescents seek more independence, rightly, just when they need more guidance. And that leads to dilemmas. Also, how we interpret adolescence can be different to how we interpret younger children. It's very often a bit less sympathetic. It very often has a little more fear. So how a behaviour is interpreted might lead to different responses. Okay. Just a couple of things. They're not necessarily specifically rural, but it's a how-to. How to ensure adolescents can have autonomy within a safe environment, to take safe risks. Something which we know and know and know is that school attainment reduces an offending risk for neglected adolescents. And we know also the importance of stability of placements. So, some final thoughts. Our response to neglect has to be universal. It has to be whole community because the referral is no longer early. By the time we know a child is being neglected, it's not necessarily early in that process. So we need to think about universal solutions, ways to enrich environments for children and for families. And the community is very important for that, the social connections and family resistance. I'd like to make a point that early doesn't mean brief. Sometimes we hope it does, but it doesn't necessarily mean brief. It means starting early for a very long haul. Nor does it necessarily mean early. Rather than early intervention, I wonder if we should think of critical period intervention, if the adolescent time is as important as the early year time in different ways. And I'd just like to emphasise to finish the importance of the total wraparound experiences to relearn things. Intermittence is almost worse than not having the experiences at all. And to emphasise that it's not just verbal intervention, the verbal matters but the key interventions are experience and doing and trying. Okay. Some things to read. Um, it's an American government website, but childwelfare.gov. If you go onto there and search for neglect, they have an absolutely brilliant summary of neglect and brain research, which is only about three years old. Um, the NSPCC produces great, you probably know it, Neglect Matters, a guide for young people, which is really useful. If you want to more, know more about the, the typical brain development, um, The Learning Brain is a really, really good book. And if you want to get back to me about any question you don't want to ask now, feel free to use my email. And if you want to challenge anything I've said, please feel free to use my email.